Uh, we're going to um, introduce ourselves. So uh, I will start and then Claire will continue. Um, uh, good day, everybody. My name is uh, Isabelle Boutron. I am professor of epidemiology at Université Paris-Cité. I'm also uh, head of a research team within the Center of Ep for Epidemiology and Statistics uh, uh, at Université Paris-Cité. I'm director of Cochrane uh, France, and I have been leading the covid anime initiative during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm delighted to be here and welcome to this uh, workshop. Claire, I pass it on to you. Uh, yes, so now you should also see the um, the presentation. Um, yeah, welcome to um, this workshop on living systematic reviews, learning from the COVID-19 experience. The slides are not moving, Claire. Yeah, and um, right now they are moving perfect. So yes, uh, Professor Isabelle Bouton um, introduced herself already. So um, my name is Claire Nitzi. I am research associate and PhD candidate at the evidence-based um, medicine department of the University Hospital Cologne. And I'm also um, joint managing editor at Cochrane Hematology. Um, I will start, yes, very briefly. Um, I'm showing you the agenda for today's workshop. So um, we will start with a general background, um, just very briefly. Um, what are systematic reviews versus living systematic reviews? The, shortly, the differences. Then we will have some uh, questions for you. So there's not that much possibility of interaction, but um, we thought um, we might pop in some uh, questions for you to think about. Um, before we then come to our experiences. So I will start with um, our lessons learned from conducted Cochrane Living Systematic Reviews on COVID-19. And then um, Isabel Bouton will um, continue with her experience on the COVID NMA initiative. Great. So very shortly um what are um yeah you can see the general process of systematic reviews so um they are all um they all start with title registration a protocol uh, then you can see in the right box the review process starting from the search the study selection the data extraction risk of bias um summary of findings until the publication um as last Step. Um, this is the standard systematic review um, procedure and structure. Then we come, um, yeah, now the living systematic review is quite different because it's, it operates, it is conducted in a living mode. Now, um, when is uh, this living approach uh, appropriate? Um, well, when the review question is particular, um, of particular priority for decision making, which was, for instance, um, the case now for um, the COVID-19 pandemic, when there is an important level of uncertainty in existing evidence, and um, when there is likely to be emerging evidence that will impact on the conclusion of the living systematic reviews. So these are three possible um, scenarios or situations when a living systematic review could be uh, could be appropriate. Now I will show you very briefly um, the, the process of how we conducted or of how um, uh, conducting living systematic review uh, usually looks like. So of course, again, um, we um, start with a search with the screening. Um, in our case, this was uh, monthly done by an information specialist, um, all displayed as a circle as um, living means at the end, you will start again all over from the beginning. Um, as next step, we extracted the data, the study characteristics, patient relevant outcomes. Um, this was also uh, done by two um, models independently. Um, then follows the bias assessment. Uh, we either use risk of bias Cochrane tool one or two tools. 
This is then followed by the analysis, uh, the data synthesis narratively, or if possible, a meta-analysis. Then we assess the certainty of the evidence using uh, the grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation grade approach. And then we continue as last comes to the conclusion and the interpretation um, um, where we have support and input from clinical experts um, as well. And then come, it ends with the publication after internal external peer review in the Cochrane Library or um, of course in other journals. And now as this is a living approach, we, we um, might consider then again to revise the definition the PICO, um, the research question, and start the process from the beginning. Okay, now comes the interactive part here. We thought um, uh, we displayed for you three questions that before we go into our uh, experiences and lessons learned, that um, you could have five to 10 minutes, um, the audience to um, get to think about these three questions to write down maybe some ideas, some keywords um, yeah, for you before um, we go into um, details. So I would, yeah, I would suggest maybe um, to have yeah, 10 minutes for this and then um, we come back uh, and we continue with the rest of the presentation. So Claire, it seems we have um, some people raising hand and some comments in the chat. Um, yes, I was not sure whether these are uh, questions or whether these are keywords that the uh, audience is um, um, collecting from people. But perhaps we could, uh, as we only have two, perhaps we could ask them to start commenting at this stage. Um, yes. We... Yeah, so depending on the time frame and how much updated doing risk of bias and data extractions could be overwhelming. Yes, time. Uh, Time is, a, of course, always it's part of the resources of the um, of the reviewer team. So um, we will also talk about this uh, in a bit. Of course, this um, this is critical. Um, so yes, um, depending on how much has to be updated, it can be. Um, it can be a, a lot of work, especially as the quality needs to be um, still guaranteed. Then the next comment was during the pandemic, poor quality research, missing data is a big challenge. Um, of course, uh, here again, poor quality research. So um, we will also talk about this, also which study designs to include. Um, of course, we usually opt to uh, include Include the highest possible quality design, but this is not always possible. Like, yes, just still evidence lacking and missing data. Yes, so here we opted to have regular contact with primary study investigators to uh, directly ask them for uh, missing data, as this, of course, was a challenge. Assessing data timely is another challenge. Yeah, true. Again, risk of bias. Uh, Lack of transparency in reporting the study methodology and results. Yes, risk of bias has always been um, yes a challenge. Yeah, we also um, experienced this that um, some studies, some primary studies we would include, um, are just not reported in the way that they should be or not um, transparently reported when it comes to um, the methodology used. Um, often, sometimes it could be claimed that the study is a randomized control trial, but then um, when consulting the methodology more precisely, we could not include the study because it was not truly randomized or um, truly controlled. So um, the risk of bias assessment has an uh, 
So very important. Um, yeah, it's very important to yet yeah, also in the quality assessment uh, of of the primary studies. Okay, now I'm not sure whether um, there's more coming. Maybe we, yeah, so maybe question to the host if it's okay to come back to the, um, to the presentation and that we, um, yeah, that we continue. Yes, we should go ahead. Perfect. Uh, and okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, for the comments. So there were quite some uh, interesting comments, and I guess you all um, came across some challenges here. Great, so now I will continue with the experience part one. So the lessons learned um, from conducted Cochrane Living Systematic Reviews on COVID-19. Um, yeah, before I start short my conflict of interest, this project uh, that I will talk about also is um, funded via the CUSIS project. Um, otherwise, I don't have any conflict of interest. Okay, so um, most of the um, the challenges, the experiences um, that I will discuss uh, in the coming workshops are based on a concept paper on methodological challenges for living systematic reviews conducted during the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, published in the JCE. And what we did here was um, collate mainly from these two um, from yeah from these two papers so once from uh, a living systematic review on convalescent plasma or hyperimmune immunoglobulin for people with COVID-19 um, we published last year the fourth publication and the fifth version of this living systematic review so it's still ongoing uh, or it's still living is in peer review um, for the Cochrane Library um, some authors were also from the um, from a rapid review on international travel related control measures to contain the COVID-19 pandemic were also um, were also involved in the concept paper to share a more yeah to share challenges um, from a more public health related topic point of view. So main so let's start also with main challenges. So these challenges, we can see them as related to the methodology of living systematic review. Um, it is, of course, um, the continuous and regular updating, as you also already mentioned before um, during your discussion. This is, um, this is a challenge, the ongoing surveillance of emerging research evidence, uh, as it is, of course, very time consuming, also um, resource, resources consuming. Um, also, um, we see that there are still unsolved aspects uh, that come up in practice in the application of living systematic review, which might seem uh, solved or which might seem perfectly fine when just looking at the um, yeah at, at the theory at the, at the methodology itself. But then in practice, um, we see that still some aspects are not uh, are not perfectly solved. And also the question, when is a living systematic review needed at all or is still needed? So when are we transitioning out of the living mode? Um, uh, yes, is still a, a question that, that uh, we also raised and is still not really, um, um, it could still not be perfectly solved. Then we um, collected challenges um, induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you have, we have a shifting epidemiological landscape. Um, as you mentioned beforehand, of course, a lot of um, clinical uncertainties, lack of evidence. Um, we basically had to start at uh, at zero um, because there is no, yeah, there, there was just no evidence, and um, 
slowly um, it became available. Um, we had to adapt to these new unexpected challenges and of course revise also standard living systematic methodology because um, yes, I will um, mention later on, we could not just apply the standard uh, methodology that we would know, but adapt to these, um, uh, to these uh, pandemic induced challenges. Um, now, one major part was stakeholder and team building. So from the beginning, uh, it was very important to involve stakeholders and to collaborate with stakeholders from a very early stage on um, and bringing together and educating on the one hand methods, method, but also content experts and vice, vice versa. So we brought together methodology, met methodologists familiar with the systematic review and the living systematic review approach, um, clinicians and scientific experts in the field, for instance, immuno immunologists or um, clinicians from the intensive care unit, from the immunology unit um, that would teach us um, what are important patient clinical and patient relevant outcomes to include in our review, um, but also living guideline developers um, were, um, were brought um, were on board. Um, we worked as part of a German ecosystem CUSIS. Um, this is a, this was a, um, a German COVID-19 evidence ecosystem to improve knowledge management and translation. Um, this was one of 13 projects with a research network of medical faculties and university hospitals within and throughout um, across Germany. Um, and it was funded by the Federal Ministry of Education uh, and Research. So that was for the stakeholder and um, yeah, team building part. Now, as I go more into um, depth into the different stage, stages of the living systematic review um, and uh, what we learned here, I would first like to um, shortly present um, the, the example I will base all my experience on from the plasma review. So as population, to give you some background, the population were people with COVID-19, inpatient as well as outpatient. The intervention was convalescent plasma. As comparator, we had either standard of care with or without placebo, standard plasma or hyperimmune immunoglobulin. And some of the outcomes from some uh, major outcomes uh, for effectiveness were mortality, invasive mechanical ventilation or death, patient discharged alive and quality of life and uh, safety, um, of course, grade three and four and serious adverse events were um, prioritized here. So just as background. Um, now in the concept paper that we then look more into depth into considerations um, of living a uh, research question and this living methodology. Um, one aspect was, of course, the choice of the study designs, um, as we had a lot of, uh, at the beginning, lack of um, randomized control trials. So we defined at protocol stage to include the highest quality evidence available, but if, of course, only non-controlled, um, non-randomized um, trials or other observational data would be available, we would, of course, first include this, and then as as soon as enough um, RCTs would come available, we would only include those. Um, for the last uh, update, for instance, we only included randomized controlled trials. We could include 13, um, but we still had to include observational data for safety evidence because there was still lacking RCT evidence here. Then the publication type, of course, should we include journal publication or also preprints? Um, because of the uh, yeah, because of the pandemic, many um, articles would be available. Yeah, many trials would be available um, and studies as preprints first. Um, so we decided to still include them because um, the information was still um, uh, very important. But then we we'll do sensitivity analysis um, to see whether there's a quality difference from journal publications which for us um, was not the case. So in the sensitivity analysis, we could not see any um, lacks in quality compared to journal publications. 
the interventions and the comparator, of course, the evolving treatment, but also standard of care. So we did not have any, um, yeah, any, um, any standard of care as, for instance, when you have oncological trials, um, here you are trying a new um, uh, or novel therapy compared to an, uh, a, the traditional, the standard that is already existing, but here no standard was existing. And also the treatment um, was evolving. For instance, we used um, convalescent plasma and here the titers level um, was different in the different um, studies used. So at the beginning, uh, lower titer level of plasma was used. And at the end, we saw that higher titer was used. So this will always um, differences in the in the treatment. Then the outcome, we had to um, continuously revise uh, our outcomes. Uh, an example, um, clinical worsening um, measured using the um, WHO 10 um, point improvement scale for COVID-19 um, was used, but then we changed this to um, need for invasive mechanical ventilation or death. And also he added death as competing event. Um, so with clinical improvement, um, we changed this outcome to patient discharged alive because in discussion with clinicians, these outcomes just turned out to be more clinically relevant and also patient relevant and would be um, and would also um, how they would be reported would just be um, data that we could actually use in our um, meta analysis. Then we come to the search strategy and other aspects uh, within this living methodology. Um, so one challenge here was the changing uh, of the database landscape. Um, and for instance, the Center for Disease and Control Prevention COVID-19 Research uh, Articles Downloadable Database, which was mid-2020, the database for preprints was then covered by the WHO um, database on um, coronavirus disease. So this was something, for instance, that uh, shows very good this changing database landscape. Um, another challenge was the dynamic nature of electronic databases. Um, we could not use our information specialist, could not use only the traditional um, databases like PubMed, Embase, or Central, but um, use now other more COVID-19 or more, yeah, more COVID-19 specific um, electronic databases that were also newly created. Um, such as the new COVID-19 register um, from Cochrane. Um, and for update search, the LOVE platform was, um, was used also by our information specialist. Um, we, uh, we would run a, a complete new search each week. And then later on, when we saw that less, um, um, that in these weekly searches, less evidence, um, less new, um, evidence become available, we, um, we change to a monthly search. Um, of course, it's important to incorporate, um, to track ongoing studies. So we had a lot of uh, over 50 ongoing studies, which we would track to see if uh, any results became available in the meantime. And um, uh, regular contact with trial investigators was very important because of uh, the missing data or the missing yeah, the missing data in the primary studies. So that was also uh, yeah, a very important aspect at this point. Um, another aspect is um, the consideration on uh, updating a review. Um, so here the question of course is when to decide, when to update the decision, when to update. Um, and here we identified additional aspects to consider. Um, I, one was policy relevance, so the COVID-19 um, related uh, yeah, topics um, were, had, of course, a highly political relevance, um, so that could, be, could act as a trigger for, for updating. Um, or waiting for important study would act as trigger for waiting um, uh, before um, publishing a new update. Um, for instance, platform trials or large 
larger studies, when we knew, okay, a very large studies on this topic would become available, we would um, wait before updating. Um, or modeling studies, small observational studies, uh, more important for the more public health related um, research questions. And of course, it depends also on the individual PICA, so on the research question and the review team and its resources, when and how often can be uh, updated. Um, for this question, update or rather not update, um, we created this, um, yeah, this flow diagram, this flow chart, which is based on the Cochrane guidance of um, living systematic review production. And um, yeah, encircled in red, you can see the parts here in blue that um, we added to the existing um, flow Cochrane flowchart. Now I'll, I will go um, through the, the flowchart to, um, to explain the different parts. So this was the initial, um, yeah, the, these parts uh, we took from the, the, the Cochrane um, guidance. And then we added the parts in blue. Now, from the beginning, um, what interests us the most is when we have an existing um, living systematic, um, an existing living systematic review, then an important S factor um, that can enable or limit the process is funding. So if there's no funding or limited funding or time or other resources available, um, the review um, would be on hold. And uh, if there's enough funding or enough resources, the team would continue with running searches and screen, um, and yeah, would continue with running the search and screen weekly or monthly the newly identified um, studies. Um, from that step on, we either identified um, no new studies or searched uh, and then searched for new studies, or we would identify new studies. And um, here we learned that there are additional aspects to consider as um, explained beforehand, the policy relevance as, uh, as, um, as potential trigger for updating or waiting for an important study. Now, if there are no new important um, if the new findings have no new important impact on our findings, on the conclusion, um, we can either update the manuscript and um, publish the review later, um, so not publish now, or we decide to still publish because of high policy relevance. This ends then in publishing now. Now, if there is some important impact um, from these new studies on our review findings, changing the conclusion, we could either wait for these important studies or um, and publish later or publish um, now. And then, as you can see, um, once we publish now, then the whole um, the whole process would start from the from the beginning. And if we do not publish now, um, the review team would um, go back to uh, running running search and identifying and um, waiting for new studies. Another important aspect was the transparent reporting of changes. Um, and therefore we um, created this summary, uh, yeah, this, this table summarizing um, for different uh, for this different um, different parts of the review, the differences not only between um, the protocol and the review, but also between the different review updates. Um, as uh, here, yeah. For instance, for participants, the intervention, the comparator, the outcomes, they could all change between the updates. And here we wanted to show in a transparent way um, why they, how they changed, they changed, and um, um, yeah, what changed and uh, why we changed it. I will display here um, from the example of our plasma review. Um, what um, what we would add in this table, only looking at the comparator here. So from the protocol um, published in, in April 2020, then we have the base review, the first version, um, nothing changed here. So the changes uh, would be none. Then we have version two, so um, the first update. Here we um, added, um, 
an eligible control treatment standard immunoglobulin. And therefore, um, we displayed the inclusion criteria. And then under changes, we explain what changed. Um, then for version three, the second update, same as above, so nothing changed. And for version um, four, um, here we you can we added the new inclusion criteria and then added under changes that we added eligible control treatment standard plasma and added specification on um, placebo treatment, the saline solution. Yes, that would it be it for our experiences. Um, I would like to thank all the co-authors from the concept paper and from the um, the author's team of both. Um, living systematic reviews, sharing their experience. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, I guess we have some time for a few questions now before we continue with experience part two um, by um, Dr. Isabel Boutron. Yeah, I think it's it's worth having some, taking some time for questions. Mm -hmm. So I think so. If you have questions, please uh, you can either add a comment in the chat, and I can read it to you, Claire, or in the Q and R. Uh, and I think someone, or you can raise your hand. So someone raised his hand. Is that all end? Yeah, I think um, the comments will be uh, displayed in the chat. Okay, it's so possible to. So the first question is: What is the time frame from Pico to publication? Um, yeah, from Pico to publication. So as um, yeah, this was a very prioritized topic. So from Pico to publication could be um, half a year. At the beginning, maybe nine months um, to 12 months, that could be the time frame. But that was also because um, we um, published with Cochrane and these COVID-19 related topics were of high priori priority, so the processes were, um, were accelerated. So yeah, nine months to a year. So there's no more questions. Perhaps could you could you detail a bit more the process to, to decide when to update and how you would apply this to another context? Because the COVID-19 pandemic was a very specific mm -hmm. context and how you would apply this to another context. Yeah, so of course, the first indicator for updating is when we have, uh, not only when we have new evidence, evidence changes, so when these new findings change the, the conclusion that we have until now, um, or if we have um, uh, observational data and now we have uh, RCT data, then this was, would also be an, uh, an, in, any, in any context an, um, a reason to update because now we have evidence, but from higher quality studies. Um, as I mentioned, these triggers like po po political rep, yet a policy relevance of a topic. Do very new novel treatment, which has um, a very specific and important uh, advantages compared to, um, to, to standard existing treatment. Uh, also here, uh, it would then be very important to share the, the existing evidence uh, sooner than later. Um, and also waiting for uh, important, for, an, yeah, for a larger study or for the so-called important studies. This is also something that um, can be yet yeah, transferred to another context because um, now during the pandemic, we were in contact with study investigators. But I think this is um, something that would be worth doing also in other contexts. And when we know there is an important, um, a big, a large um, RCT coming, we would wait, wait for um, we would wait wait for it to be published and then um, and then update. So I think also this is transferable. Sweet. Oh, sorry. 
Um, I've got some questions in QNR. How frequent should we update the protocol guidelines for the best patient care? Um, the, yeah, the protocol or guideline for... Well, the protocol up to the guidelines. So I, I, I think here the question is how frequent should we do the updates? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that that depends actually. It all depends on um yeah, on the knowledge that we got on the topic. So um if there is no knowledge, um I think the protocol as it is will not be challenged, but uh, we would update then um the research question and the main inclusion and exclusion criteria. So if there are that that's why it's important to have also this um um collaboration with with clinicians, with experts in the field. So if there is new knowledge on a specific uh, disease, um, then of course it makes sense to, um, uh, to, to revise and to update um, the inclusion exclusion criteria, the research question, if for instance, a new standard treatment um, uh, came or if there's just new knowledge about the process or the timeline of the disease, or also knowledge on um, how um, on patient reported on patient related outcomes. Um, what so that was how we decided whether to update these um, yeah these criteria or not. Just um, talking to the clinician, seeing what needs to be updated. Do we have new knowledge, new evidence on the disease? Okay, there is also another. Questions mm -hmm. on is there a specific definition for living systematic review? Um, yeah, I can see it. the press important, but also dissemination is critical. Would you use clinical trial? Yes, yeah, so uh, of course, there are um, definitions for living systematic review. One must say it's a very yeah, it's a novel, it's an emerging um, uh, type of um, systematic review. So um, uh, it's what it's not, it's, it's not because we have systematic reviews and then in every two year, we would also try to update these. That's not what living systematic reviews are. It's really um, continuous search, continuous surveillance for new evidence. So it's not we leave it and then we have a look at it in two years, but it's really this continuous process of um, surveying the, um, the new evidence. There are definitely specific def de definitions, for instance, the Cochrane uh, guidance on production of living systematic reviews uh, defines this, or there is an, an, um, an, uh, um, a series of papers um, published in the JCE um, with um, concrete definitions on what is a living systematic review. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, and there's also one question mm -hmm. uh, um, um, about the use of clinical trial registries. Um, yes, so uh, our information specialist um, um, uh, also um, included into the search strategy clinical trial registries. Um, they were um, because um, they would identify all these new um, all the new trials. And also, when we had, for instance, for tracking the ongoing studies, so we had more than fifty ongoing studies. So we had to track them manually. And what we would do is go to the clinical trials, enter the NCT number or the yeah, the, 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 the trial number, and then see on what is the status, if it's still recruiting, if it's completed, if there are uh, results available. So here was very helpful, yeah, to look at the registries. Okay, and uh, another question, which is related to teaching, is it applicable to teach undergrad students about uh, systematic review in general, PICO, but also living systematic review, what's your? experience on that uh, yes of course we um, had a lot of internal but also external um, uh, teaching um, of course you learn the most when actually um, doing it but um, I, I think it is definitely 
applicable to each our undergraduate students um, uh, in general. We um, saw it, okay, now we had clinicians and other experts, but also here we had to teach. So they teach us, um, uh, they taught us um, about the clinical uh, parts um, and we, um, um, yeah, we were teaching them um, about systematic resist, living systematic resist, PICO, et cetera. So I think, um, yes, this is- Yeah, I, I, I can add some comments on that. Mm -hmm. we, we are definitely pushing to, 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 to teach uh, undergraduate students, perhaps more on, not so much on how they should conduct a living systematic review or a systematic review, but really understanding why it's important, how it's conducted, and uh, being able to uh, critically appraise a systematic review and a living systematic review. And one last comment related to highlight, someone is highlighting um, the huge limitations in having access to information specialists and whether you had any advice uh, on that. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I know limitations in um, people and resources is a big problem. We have an information specialist that um, is working within our team now already for 13 years. So we have an, uh, one information specialist and she does all the all our searches, um, all our um, yeah, all our searches, all our search strategies. Um, but I don't think I do have any advice here. Um, Probably yeah. some sort of uh, thinking uh, uh, discussions with uh, as different institutions to make sure that uh, uh, information specialists that are being trained mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. within the different institutions to be able to provide support and to do a, a systematic review that would probably be be my advice uh, on that. Yeah, true. Our information specialist, she was also in contact with information specialists from other universities, from other teams. Uh, they have like some, yeah, sort of a network or group where they can share these new um, these new advices also related to new databases, but also um, when they are uh, on use um, when they could not um, um, they could not get hold on an article or um, um, yeah just to exchange these experiences. Okay, I think we went through the different questions so. I'm going um, to share my screen. So, um, uh, sorry about that. So I'm going to, to present the COVID NMA initiative that was really set up at the right uh, beginning of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but was built on previous work that we have been doing on uh, um, the evidence synthesis uh, ecosystem. So we did publish in 2020 uh, three articles uh, with Philippe Havo and some other colleagues from Cochrane in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, questioning the current um, uh, evidence synthesis ecosystem. Indeed, when we looked at the different literature, you have a huge number of systematic review and meta-analysis being published. In some domains, you even have more a systematic review and meta-analysis being published, then uh, randomized controlled trials being published to answer the questions. Very often, these uh, systematic review and meta-analysis are published in a sort of a, just a one shot. So they do the search, so they set up, the authors set up a whole system to identify all the, the articles, to extract data, to do the analysis, and then they publish their paper and move to something different. And so there's no process very often planned to update this meta-analysis. And these systematic review and meta-analysis are very often focusing on a very narrow research question. And so when we look at the overall literature, overall, we found that there is a lot of redundancy, several uh, publications answering the same questions, but there are also important gaps. And overall, we are always in the same situations where the conclusion of the systematic review and meta-analysis is quite frustrating because it relies on primary research that is frequently high risk of bias, 
frequently inadequately reported with a lot of information missing and frequently evaluating diverse outcomes and so that in the end we don't have enough data to be able to synthesize uh, and do a meta-analysis. And so we thought that this was problematic probably because the research ecosystem is currently organized in silo. You have the uh, community dedicated to primary research conducting randomized control trial, a community dedicated to evidence synthesis doing meta-analysis and systematic review, and another community dedicated to guideline development. And there was there is very few communications between the different community, uh, community particularly between the trialist and the systematic reviewer. And so our hypothesis was that we probably need to move toward a new research ecosystem where we would put around the table uh, people from these different community, trialists, systematic reviewer, guidelines developer, funders, uh, decision maker, and try to decide what is the primary evidence we need how we are going to synthesize this primary evidence and organizing sort of a feedback loop where the information being obtained at the evidence synthesis level would inform the primary researcher and help them plan better their trials and improve uh, the overall evidence uh, available. So that was our thought before the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we had the COVID-19 pandemic and we thought that we were clearly in a situation where stakeholders needed trustful information, high quality information about all the evidence that is available. And that this information needed to be up to date and easily accessible. So we decided to set up the COVID NMA initiative, which relies on three main pillars a living mapping. Uh, relying on all the information that is uh, registered, a living systematic review where we would identify all uh, a study with results and synthesize the evidence, and also living monitoring and feedback, evaluating the quality of reporting of research, the transparency of the published research, and providing a feedback to the investigator to help them improving the dissemination of their results. It was a large, sorry, international project. Um, we set up a very large consortium. We had first a steering committee uh, with people from various expertise, a lot of people from Cochrane, but uh, also uh, uh, content experts. And the idea was that we would rely on the steering committee to decide uh, how we would set up our protocol and how we would uh, how the protocol will evolve over time. We had a lot of uh, people that joined the COVID NMA project. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was really uh, volunteers who just came to us and say, well, we've got time, uh, we would be happy to help, just let us know what we, what we can do. So that was uh, very, very stimulating. And we had to obtain quite a lot of funding because it's a project that is still uh, moving. So we had uh, funding first from the Agence Nationale de la Recherche in France, uh, from the Ministry of Research. Then we were uh, contacted by the WHO, uh, who decided to support us. And we did this project in uh, conjunction with the WHO, who is supporting us, uh, contacting the authors, but also providing some funding. And then Cochrane France, the uh, French Ministry of Higher Education, um, a lot of institutions in France, the CNRS, and also uh, some institutions in Germany with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And finally, we were invited to participate in a European research project dedicated to vaccine and got funding from that. So it's various source of funding. Uh, and so we just try everywhere to find some funding. But at the beginning, if you want, we just rely on volunteer on our team to try to set up the project. We set up a platform, so it's a website, and you can have access to the website where we uh, put all our data. So as you can see here, up to now, 
uh, we identify more than four and extracted more than uh, almost 4,500 uh, studies um, evaluating treatment and preventive intervention for COVID-19. And we identify, extracted and analyzed uh, 827 uh, studies. The idea was of the platform was to put all the information available online so that people could easily uh, access them. We also, uh, as part of the beginning of the project with the steering committee, we first decided to have a very large scope with the idea that it would be probably a network meta-analysis at in one point, but our, our scope at the beginning was very large. It was all treatment, pharmacological, non-pharmacologic treatment for, of COVID-19 um, and all uh, preventive interventions. So at the beginning, it was uh, not some non-pharmacological preventive intervention, and then it moved uh, to vaccine. So initially, our scope was really large. And progressively, this scope changed over time. The second point when we set up the project is the type of studies. So at the beginning of the pandemic, there was no randomized control trials. It was too early. So at the very beginning, we decided to uh, consider observational studies because this was the only information and the only evidence that was available. And when we started having and identifying randomized controlled trials, we changed our process and focused only on randomized controlled trials. At one point, the WHO asked us to uh, do an extension for uh, variant uh, for the efficacy of vaccine on variant. And so we, we extended during a specific durations on uh, observational study, um, evaluating vaccine, uh, the efficacy on vaccine of vaccine on variant. And then at one point we decided to stop. So you can see here that the process and the approach allowed uh, huge flexibility. And so we could adapt according to the information available according to the stakeholder needs, and of course, according to the resources uh, available uh, within the team. So the first pillar is a living mapping. So what we decided to do was to search uh, the clinical trial registry. So we are relying on the WHO um, platform, the ICTRP. Uh, but also on some primary, so all the, the primary registry uh, that uh, are uh, on the WHO platform, but we are also directly extracting uh, data from the clinicaltrial.gov registry, the EU registry, and I think the Iranian registry. To do this, we worked uh, on uh, with team, very well-known uh, IT teams uh, um, in, in informatic, who help us to develop a data warehouse, which allows uh, uh, retrieving the information and the data from the registry, but also standardizing the, the data because each registry, each national registry has a different organization. And so if we want the data to be useful, you need to very much clean the data uh, to be able to, to reuse them in a consistent way. So there was a huge work that took more than, yeah, one and a half and about two years to set up this data warehouse that progressively allow us to com considerably reduce the, the, the resources needed to have this information. We, when we identify a trial that is registered, we extract some data. For example, we classify uh, the treatment. The data that are extracted are also evolving over time. So, for example, for vaccine, uh, at one point we extracted data related to whether they are considering a, a variant, whether it's a specific population like pregnant women or immunosuppressed patients. And so we could, you know, be quite flexible in the data we are going to extract according to the new types of trials that are arriving. And so currently we are directly um, extracted the data uh, on the data warehouse. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we needed 
uh, four people full time uh, to extract this data uh, um, every every week, and now we rely on two two people one one person with uh, half time with two volunteers that are helping us extracting the data. So we were able to considerably reduce the workload. And these data are really important because uh, if you go on the website, you can see uh, that interactive data visualization uh, on all the trials that are being conducting. So these are the interactive data visualization of the trials that are conducting whatever the treatment. And people can do some filtering to try, for example, if you want to identify only studies that are performed in Brazil, you click on Brazil and you will see a list of studies that are performed in Brazil, and you can see exactly when they were conducted, what type of treatment they are evaluating, what type of disease severity, whether they published results, etc. We also use this data to have a, a good idea of what is uh, what are the studies that have been done, and so you can see here over time. So you've got time here, April uh, 2020 to uh, April 2022. This is a number of trials. And what is quite interesting here is that you can see that, that you know, early after some specific communications about hydroxychloroquine, there is a huge number of randomized control trials that have been planned on hydroxychloroquine. And same for convalescent plasma, ivermectin, which uh, did not show much uh, uh, efficacy. In contrast, there are much less trials on uh, dexamethasone, tocilizumab. So the mapping is going to be important for two reasons. First, it's going to be important but because it will inform stakeholder. It will inform trialist. I mean, probably we don't need any more trial uh, on hydroxychloroquine, and perhaps we should focus on different types of questions. So, for example, we are part of the Vaccelerate EU project, and every time a new trial is planned, we check using the living mapping whether it's worth it and what were the other trials being uh, published. It was also very useful to determine what were the most uh, relevant outcome to collect and to consider in the systematic review. And so we could map what were the outcomes that were being evaluated, determine which were the ones that was were uh, actually relevant, and plan our systematic review accordingly. We did that for vaccine, we did that for pharmacologic treatment, and it was really helpful to be able to rely on mapping. And of course, when we are doing the systematic review, it allows contacting easily the author to have more information on whether their study is still ongoing or is published or whether the, the results are going to be uh, available soon. And it's very useful also to have a good idea of what amount of evidence from all the evidence that is currently being uh, collected will be included in the systematic review. So, for example, for some living systematic review, we know that there is almost uh, no trial registers that are ongoing and probably we will receive uh, no new uh, uh, evidence for this research question. So that's for the living mapping. The second um, pillar was the living systematic review. So for this, we did a quite complex uh, process. We use the data that we obtained from the living mapping. Uh, so the living mapping is updated uh, weekly. Every week, we uh, collect uh, the new information and we update all the information that is on the platform. We update all the data visualization uh, from the BAPIC. For the living systematic review, so at the beginning we were searching every day. Now we are searching uh, weekly and updating our analysis every two weeks. So we, are, we were searching uh, all the major uh, uh, electronic database. Two people were screening the titles and abstract selecting the relevant studies. All the data were extracted in duplicate uh, through a platform. And it was a platform that 
uh, each reviewer extract the data independently. The platform will automatically identify discrepancy. The reviewer will discuss, achieve agreement, and then validate the studies. There was also an evaluation of the risk of bias in duplicate using the risk of bias uh, tool uh, to um, uh, the second uh, one, the most recent one. And every week, and now every two weeks, we were updating the analysis and producing forest plot for all the comparison for which we had uh, data. And all the forest plots are uh, made available online. For all the treatment comparison where we have more than two randomized control trials, we are also grading the evidence and the grading of the evidence is also made available online. And every week we were starting again. For us, there was two main points that were important. First, quality. We needed to make sure that it was high quality data. So everything was done in duplicate. We also set up a quality control uh, for the risk of bias assessment with the Cochrane uh, Methods Bias Group, um, which uh, select a random sample of randomized control trials, evaluate the risk of bias, give us feedback, and allow us to improve uh, uh, the quality of our assessment. So at the beginning, it was a very frequent quality control, which helped us stabilize uh, uh, the system. And now it's a regular uh, quality control uh, with very uh, uh, almost no, few problems uh, identified. So that quality was key. The second key was uh, being up to date. So because we wanted to be up to date, we thought that publication in a peer review journals was not the right way of communication because the information was changing too quickly. And so, for example, currently when we um, when we um, uh, when we publish our results, very often the result that we do published uh, is outdated. Uh, and so in the publications, we inform the reader that this is the result at that time point, and that for more updated results, they can rely on the platform and have access to uh, more updated uh, information. So quality and um, the fact that it was up to date was very important. So that was uh, most important. The second important point was that if we wanted to be able to continue, we needed to um, reduce the workload. And so we systematically tried to identify the different tasks that were uh, very much time consuming and develop tools to, re to reduce this task. Of course, we also had some specific issues that were related to COVID-19. One important issue was related to preprint. Indeed, a lot, about 60% of the information that were um, published and made available to author, to, to a, a systematic reviewer, was communicated through preprint. And preprint is a living document. So a preprint can be updated by the author, and a preprint can also be secondarily published. So we needed to identify tools to be able, so we decided, first we decided to include preprint in the systematic review and eventually to do some uh, sensitivity analysis. But we needed to have some tools to identify when a preprint was updated and to consequently update the data that were on the website. And I will show you what, what we did. Finally, very often uh, you need more information. And so we also set up a system to systematically contact authors uh, to obtain the missing information. And this was done in collaboration with the WHO. We were indicating what information were missing and the WHO was sending the request to the author, which allowed having a, a much more um, uh, feedback from the author. 
finally, uh, you, I mean, you know, you can always do mistake or, or misunderstand, even if you have a high quality control. Finally, the fact that all our information was on a website accessible to everybody, it meant that anyone could contact us if they identified an issue. And this did happen. We were contacted by some researcher saying, you should be careful. Uh, I believe this uh, study is not a randomized controlled trials and providing us some information and we could then uh, exclude uh, the study from the analysis or some uh, comment on, on some of the data we extracted. So you also can rely on the crowdsourcing uh, in terms of, of problems and people were invited to provide feedback. So to allow all this uh, uh, system and to reduce the workload, we had to develop uh, a platform. So we have a back office where uh, all the um, researcher can have access to uh, uh, what are, are the informations that, that need, uh, what are the studies that need uh, data extraction, what are the studies that are in process, and they can uh, start extracting the data and uh, organize the simultaneous data extraction of several extractors, a consensus, a validation. As soon as the study was validated, the information was online. And so we have a link between this back office where we extract all our data, have all our quality control, and have also um, the possibility to uh, add new data. And a front uh, office, which is a website where people can access all the information from the living mapping to uh, the information we extracted to the forest plot and the grading. We also had to make sure that this platform was um, scalable, uh, meaning that every time there was a new question, it would be easy to create a new data extraction and a new communication of the results. So for example, at the beginning, we were focusing mainly on treatment for COVID-19. And then when the vaccine arrived, we had to move to a, a, a new data extraction form to extract data from vaccine. And so uh, we set up the platform. So extracting new data, uh, tackling a new uh, type of uh, comparisons would be easy and not too much uh, time consuming. What was also really important was to be open and transparent. So we are open because all our information is online. We are transparent because people can access for each study all the data we extracted related to the general characteristic of the study, but also related to the risk of bias. So we give access to our assessment of the risk of bias and also the justification of why we assess it, we assessed this risk of bias as being a low risk of bias. People have access to our analyses. So our analyses are reported by comparisons currently. We do only two by two comparison at this stage. We will do a network meta-analysis. We are working on a network meta-analysis uh, currently. And uh, for all the primary and secondary outcomes we identify, uh, extracted, and uh, uh, analyzed, people can have access to forest plot. So here you can see uh, the forest plot with all the study, the follow-up uh, duration, the intervention and the comparator, the number of events in each arm, the effect estimates, here it's a risk ratio, the risk of bias for each study, and of course, the weight of the study and the risk uh, ratio and the overall risk ratio. Um, there is uh, automatically sort of a, um, a subgroup analysis that is done on uh, the type uh, of population. To reduce the workload, we had to try to, and we systematically say, try to find other way to reduce the workload. So for example, the platform was one way to reduce the workload, but to find specific tools or, uh, to reduce the workload, but to systematically evaluate whether we could trust this tool before using them. 
Just to give you an example, at the beginning, we were relying on a very large uh, search strategy, okay? PubMed, MedArchive, et cetera. Uh, we, we needed, you know, uh, every, every day about five people were screening. Uh, so it was a huge amount of people. So at the beginning of the pandemic, it was fine because you had a lot of people who were locked down, had time and were happy to help. But we couldn't continue like that uh, for a long time. And hopefully uh, you, you're probably aware of the Love platform that was uh, developed by Epistenico, Epistemonikos and uh, Cochrane Chili. And uh, uh, the Love platform relies on crowdsourcing and artificial intelligence and uh, uh, reduce, uh, classify the different uh, studies and publication dedicated to COVID. We work with them and uh, we compare the sensitivity and specificity of the Love platform to the sensitivity and specificity of a very large and complex search strategy. And we demonstrated that the Love platform, in addition to the Cochrane COVID-19 study registered when you use the two, uh, but even if you use the Love platform alone, was, uh, very, um, was very good. And so we decided to rely only on the Love platform, which so it allowed uh, collaborations with epistemonicos and a considerable re reduction in the workload. I told you about the issue related to preprint. We needed to have a tools allowing to link preprint, be informed when there is an update of the preprint and be informed when a preprint is published. So we worked with uh, Guillaume Cabanag from the CNRS who developed a tool where we enter the DOI of the preprint and systematically, automatically, we will be informed on uh, whether there is a publication. We evaluated uh, this uh, tool and showed that it was very efficient. And so you have a paper each time where we use a tool, we evaluate it before implementing it into the system. And so we have the preprint tracker COVID-19 preprint tracker that is used uh, regularly uh, um, by, by the team. Another point that was really raised uh, during uh, the study is that we needed to provide support to the user. Someone who wants to use uh, the information on our uh, website, currently they have access to all the forest plot but done with uh, random effect and with uh, specific uh, subgroup analysis, but people can't do their own uh, data. So here we have uh, a tool that was developed by um, Theodoros Evrinoglou, a PhD student who is supervised by Anna Shemani. And he developed a tool that uh, allows anyone to use, the tool is called MetaCovid. Anyone can use the data we extracted. So you know that the data are being extracted, rely on a very uh, a trustful search strategy of being extracted in duplicate. And they can choose a treatment comparison. So for example, um, here they, we choose tocilizumab versus standard care. You select a given outcome. If you click on view, data table, you can see all the general characteristics of the study included. And people can see the related forest plot. And people can play with the data. So for example, you could move from a random effect to a common effect. You can um, do different types of analysis uh, to, to uh, estimate uh, the heterogeneity. You can do different types of subgroup analysis according to the severity, conflict of interest, the funding source, location, type of control. You can exclude high risk of bias, high risk of bias and study with some concern. You can exclude preprint and you can uh, have two different ways of analyzing the data. And so all these um, options, sorry, all these options uh, are options that were planned in our protocol. So we are giving access only to the analyses that were pre-specified in our protocol. 
But it helps people, you know, doing their analysis, they can download the forest plot and then uh, uh, have access to the forest plot. So this is really to help guidelines developer to rely on our data to develop their guideline for their own country or for their own setting. So that's called MetaCovid and it's available on uh, our um, platform. And there is currently a paper being uh, published on MedArchive. So for a very long time, we really did only on the platform. So the data were available on platform and were used by the WHO, were used by some guidelines developer, for example, in, in South Africa, the team uh, uh, really used the data we, we, we made uh, available on the platform. We also published um, uh, Cochrane Review on IL6 with an update, but each time, uh, at the time of the publication, the Cochrane Review is outdated. And so people are informed that they should go on the website, on the platform to check whether the results have changed. But they already, you know, they have the image at a time point, but COVID went so quickly, uh, it was really important to have this platform available. So we have also uh, two articles in press and one in process that we, which will be a network meta-analysis on immunomodulator. What we felt was also probably quite important was to, um, uh, in addition to this uh, publication, which are peer review publications, so take a very long time, the peer review process, and then you have to answer to reviewer, et cetera. We also produce a summary of the main results where, so the summary of the main results currently focus only on immunomodulator and antiviral. And so we provide a synthesis of what are the main results. This is done monthly. So people can see every month how uh, the information on uh, these two um, uh, questions evolved over time. Finally, as I told you, we had three um, pillars. One was uh, living mapping, was, one was uh, living evidence synthesis. We also wanted to do a living monitoring of the quality uh, because the workload was too high. We were not able to do a living monitoring, but we did uh, uh, an assessment of the first 251 COVID-19 trials. Here you can see for the COVID-19 trial that uh, assessed uh, uh, drug treatment that is now published in uh, BMC Medicine. And you can see the transparency indicator. So for example, only 56% were prospectively registered, 38% had a protocol available, 40% a statistical analysis available. And the reporting was uh, insufficient with only one third completely defining the primary outcome and only 14% adequately describing harm. We didn't have time to implement completely our proof of concept with providing feedback to the authors related to um, uh, this information. And I think probably the context of COVID-19 was not a good context to implement this part of the new uh, uh, evidence ecosystem. But in another context, I think it would be really important to try to think how we can monitor the reporting as part of the living systematic review and how we can provide useful feedback to funders and investigators. So just to show that it's involved a lot of people, a lot of people work on, uh, on this uh, project with people coming, leaving, uh, but it's a huge amount of people that were involved with a lot of people that are volunteer. And now we are continuing to, um, to do the work the scope evolved over time. So it was at the beginning, all pharmacologic treatment and vaccine. And then we reduced currently, we're updating only um, immunomodulators for COVID-19 and antiviral for COVID-19, as well as vaccine. And progressively, we are reducing uh, uh, the scope on specific research questions. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm would be delighted to answer some question and I can show also a bit more about uh, the platform if needed, if we have time.
so clear. I don't know if yeah. you could tell me the question. Yes, I can tell you the question. So there is one question. Um... Uh, yes, one question. Um, how how could we could get more information about the new research ecosystem? I think this was. Yeah, so the new research ecosystem, it, it's really, you know, it was a, a paper that is published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. Um, and among the authors, you have myself and uh, Philippe Raveau. And it's a, a series of three articles uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. So all the information is available uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. So is there a plan to have a, a plain language summary for the public? So we've been so the communication of the results is very complex. The communication of the results, um, we made a very strategic decision to not publish at the beginning. This strategic decision had some advantage, but also some issues. The advantage is that we have one place where anyone can go have the most up-to-date data. So that was hugely uh, useful. The issue, I would say that for some people, it was a problem uh, to feel confident reusing the data, knowing that they were not published. Even if, you know, it was a Cochrane, you know, it was a project with a very strong link with Cochrane, with a very strong link with the WHO, the fact that there was no peer-reviewed publication, I know stopped some people in using the data. The second issue here related to the fact that it's online is how we communicate the change we do in protocol. So, um, so we have the protocol that is available online, uh, but we need a good way to uh, inform people using the platform of the change in the protocol. And so we did it, we did some uh, information, different places, etc. But I think we need a clear evaluation on whether people actually get the information, understand the information and what they get from it. The second point is that, um, uh, you know, because of the amount of time available and because the resource available, currently the platform is really uh, made for people who have quite good level of expertise, good understanding in systematic in review and meta-analysis. To try to, to, um, to um, uh, be, uh, to, to have other user, we developed this, um, uh, we developed um, uh, a, a document that uh, is updated every three months about, uh, you know, sort of a newsletter about the main results. But again, this newsletter, I think you need someone, people who are quite specialized. I think we would have to develop a completely uh, different types of platform um, if we want to, uh, to, to have the public using this platform. And I think this really need a lot of work, need uh, evaluations. We started doing it and and submitted a, a proposal to, to a grant with some people who are really specialized in data design uh, and started testing the platform to try to, uh, how we could improve it, but we didn't have the funding and so we stopped there. But I agree that there's really a need to make the platform usable uh, by anyone. Uh, we have maybe not a question, but a comment um, in, the, in the chat. One person, I, su I suggest this platform should be part of any systematic review that looks into COVID-19 treatment and vaccination. Yeah, I think that that would be... Um... I think the ideal would be to have, if we, if we think of another topic, uh, you know, outside of, uh, of COVID, I think what we would like to see would be to have a group of researchers involving people doing randomized control trials, 
probably people also uh, used to analyze routinely collected data and doing observational uh, uh, studies. People doing evidence synthesis, funders, um, decision makers, guidelines developer in a group. And this group would you know, set up a, a system and a platform and synthesize and improve the development of the evidence for a specific question. So you could you know, imagine any type questions. It needs to be quite large questions. So I would say you know, Alzheimer disease or um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or you know, uh, thinking of a topic a domain where you would bring all the different people with a different expertise and develop your platform uh, to um, tackle the evidence from the generation of the evidence to the synthesis and the use of the evidence by this uh, by these people so for me that would be sort of the the vision that you would have with a system that would have a feedback loop allowing to improve the quality of primary studies this was really what we wanted to do for example at the beginning but covid19 was not the good um, example at the beginning we wanted to and we started contacting investigator saying, oh, be careful, make sure you assess these five outcomes. Because if you don't assess these five outcomes, we won't be able to analyze it in the, in the meta-analysis and the network meta-analysis. It was complex for the COVID because you don't have clear rule of what was a good outcome for COVID-19. And I think nobody knew what was a good outcome for COVID-19. So, um, so it was not, and people were completely overwhelmed. So it was probably not a good uh, example to really have this feedback loop. But if you have another topic, you work in Alzheimer's disease, you identify all studies that are evaluating a treatment for Alzheimer. And um, every time the studies is uh, registered, you could immediately contact the investigator saying, oh, beware that you're going to evaluate these outcomes. Uh, be aware that your protocol is available. And this way you could also increase and improve the primary research. And then we have a question, does the system also track and collect published systematic reviews? Um, yes, through, um, I think we track them. Um, well, we, we don't track them, but um, uh, the LOVE platform by Epistemonikos looked at published systematic review to identify primary studies. But we are not comparing our results for uh, to primary uh, systematic review. We do it sometimes, you know, when we do a publication to put our results in the context of other research, but not as a usual process. It would be too much work. And then we have three questions from one person. The first question, what methodological guidance did you follow in terms of living systematic review or living evidence synthesis? Was this sufficient? Uh, I would say, I mean, uh, around the table, you had, you know, mainly Cochrane, people from Cochrane collaboration. So, um, so I think we just rely on uh, our, what we know about um, uh, systematic review. And we were very pragmatic, you know, very pragmatic on how uh, with limited resources, uh, huge need and huge pressure, how we can make something uh, working well. And, and I would say, I think we, we still, you know, we're still learning of what, what would be the best way to implement such a platform. So we know now we know more because we had some difficulties and we know what we should uh, avoid and what we should uh, uh, do. And the platform that we would develop tomorrow would be completely different from the platform that we developed at the beginning, which you know was, we needed to have a platform very quickly. So it was very simple. And then we improved it over time. Um, so I think we're still learning and probably there's some approach that we did for COVID that might not work in another context. Um, I think, for example, the link with, um, with Epistemonikos was, was key for the success of the, of the project. Uh, the link with uh, Cochrane Bios Method Group was also key to make sure that we were evaluated uh, high quality data. Um, so, so I think we are still and we're currently working on the, on the paper to try to to um, summarize uh, 
the 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 experience and what we had to do sort of a in French we call it a retour d'expérience to you know a return of experience to describe what what you got from this experience. Next question is when and how will you decide if the living if the evidence no longer needs to be living? So this decision is made by the by the steering committee. So it's not us deciding, but uh, by the steering committee in uh, uh, collaboration with the WHO. Um, so um, and the, the feedback from the WHO was really important. So we we you know we proposed to the WHO to uh, to move uh, toward a specific way. Uh, I think it's it's really. For COVID nineteen, it really depended on the needs. Um, you know, when when the the needs became to be vaccine and uh, efficacy on vaccine or variant, uh, it was quite easy, for example, to stop uh, updating the hydroxychloroquine systematic review. Uh, so there's some systematic review that was quite easy just to to let go and to focus on the the one that uh, were uh, seemed the most uh, important. And also uh, knowing how many evidence is upcoming was quite important. So if we know that there's, you know, for IL-6, for example, there's very few information registered. It's been registered for a long time with still no results. Um, I don't think we, we would have to update much this systematic review and we might stop. Okay, then the last question do end users or stakeholders know how to engage with living evidence more or less compared to non-living evidence i think currently it's still difficult it's still difficult because um, people want an answer <laughs> you know they want to know what what should i do now and uh, it's difficult to think well what i should uh, i should do now might change in one week uh particularly for covid uh, so, again, that's where we probably still need to work on how we present the results, how we explain the, uh, about the results, um, uh, particularly how we account on uh, uh, the different update and the change in the grading uh, uh, over time. Um, so, so I think there's still uh, a lot of methodological research to do to, to really know how um, uh, we make sure that uh, this information is adequately understood and used by uh, by the users. So I think, you know, for example, guidelines developer would be uh, easy because they, you know, they feel the need to um, to uh, to do living guidelines. But for other uh, stakeholders, it might be more difficult. So I think we need more time and more research on this topic. It, there were no more questions. Okay, I think we are on time. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Okay, so if there is no more question, unless there is a burning question, uh, I think we can probably close the session. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, listening to us and uh, asking questions. Uh, we were not expecting so many people <laughs> with Claire. We were expecting having 30 people uh, with uh, interaction with 30 people. So it's it's great to see that we had lots of uh, people, but also a very interesting and stimulating question. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. It was very nice working with you. And uh... yes, thank you very much as well. And um, yeah, very interesting session. <laughs>